Thanks. I appreciate uh, the invite. Thank you very much for having me. Uh, my name is Aline Morrow, and um, I work for the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, the federal uh, uh, Fish and Wildlife Agency. Um, and today I'm here to talk about a little brown bird uh, called the Florida Grasshopper Sparrow. Um, the Florida Grasshopper Sparrow is a small bird. Um, they're only about five inches long. Um, and there's actually two species of grasshopper sparrows that can be found in similar in the similar habitat types. Um, and that's the Florida grasshopper sparrow and the Eastern grasshopper sparrow, which um, Floridanus is the Florida grasshopper sparrow and then Pretensis is the Eastern species. Um, the Florida grasshopper sparrow uh, stays in Florida year round whereas the pretensis is a migratory species and they migrate um, up north to do their nesting. Um, Florida grasshopper sparrows get their common name from their call. Um, while they do eat insects, that's not why we call them grasshopper sparrows. Their call is very insect-like and buzzy. Um, and if you ever get a chance to hear them out in the field, um, it's very, you can, what, once you know the call, you'll recognize it. Uh, Florida grasshopper sparrows nest um, between April and June, uh, with the peak being in about May and early June. Um, and that time of year is when you'll find us biologists out in the field um, doing our point count surveys to find out um, where the sparrows are out on the landscape and also um, how many and also um, take care of um, their nesting needs as I'll get into um, as we get through the, uh, the presentation. Um, Florida grasshopper sparrows may nest twice a year depending on um, different factors, including the weather, insect, if, you know, how the insects are due, if there's enough food, right? Um, and if for whatever reason they have a nest failure, um, they they readily will re-nest. Um, the clutch sizes for Florida grasshopper sparrow are about, um, the mean size is about three, um, three birds. Um, and I talk about re-nesting because Florida grasshopper sparrows are found in the dry prairie. Great example of dry prairie right here behind me. Um, this is a fire dependent um, habitat. Uh, it is treeless, as you can see. Uh, Florida grasshopper sparrows hate trees. Um, and it also has a very low to zero shrub cover. Um, we try to, we like to say that the Florida grasshopper sparrows prefer to have their habitat with any vegetation, has to be under four feet. Um, uh, in order to get that, uh, and oh, I should say, they also like to have about 20% bare ground. Um, and really it's to balance their life history needs of um, bare ground for foraging, but then having the low shrubbery so that they can move around. These birds primarily spend most of their life on the ground. Um, which is why we do all of our surveying um, during the breeding and nesting season because the males will come up and sing and then we can we can track them. Um, again, habitat being fire dependent, one to two year fire return interval. That means this habitat behind me right here is burning every year to every other year. Lightning season, um, historically, Florida grasshopper sparrows, and we'll see a map of this um, later on. Historically, they're um, found in the areas that have the most lightning strikes um, of the entire peninsula. And again, because they like no trees, more fire means not very many trees, low shrubs, right? Um, the male mean life expectancy is two years, but um, We've had birds out that we've banded out um, out on the prairie that have lived up to seven years, and I think they may even still be out there. Um, so 
depend it, you know, again, there are a lot of different factors involved, but um, the mean, the mean life expectancy is two years. A little bit of, I guess, history of the Florida grasshopper sparrow. Um, they were first described in 1902, um, and that description is is very well recognized. Um, in 1977, um, the state recognized that the birds were um, showing some decline. <laughs> so they listed them as endangered. Um, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service um, federally listed them uh, as endangered back in 1986. And I actually found out uh, while I was looking up this information that the Florida grasshopper sparrow was listed on the day that I was born, that I came into this world. So I thought that was um, a little a little wild and apparently a reason why I'm working with them today. Um, in between 1998 and 2017, um, the Fish and Wildlife Service and FWC um, recognized that there was a very precipitous decline in Florida grasshopper sparrow numbers at the sites that they were monitoring, which um, prompted us to begin a captive breeding um a captive breeding um, program, um, which I will be speaking about as well. Uh, so when a species is listed on the Endangered Species Act, um, it's required to have um, recovery actions or recovery milestones to get delisted or taken off of the list, right? We are in the we, our job is to put ourselves out of a job. <laughs> um, we are trying to get these birds to a place where they can be self-sufficient. Um, so there are two, there are sort of two criteria, a few criteria that um, the Florida grasshopper sparrow has to meet to be downlisted from endangered to threatened and then taken off of the list or delisted. Um, to be downlisted, there needs to be at least 50 breeding pairs established at 10 different locations within its former range. Each of those locations must show a rate of increase equal to or greater than zero, so no decline. Um, but that rate um, should be sustained as a two-year running average over at least um, the last six years. So that's for it to get downlisted. For us to um, start making the decision to take it off the list, um, it needs to meet those um, criteria for downlisting in addition to another 12 locations. And six of those locations have to be on protected lands. Protection being either um, owned by um, a federal or state entity or protected under um, a conservation easement or owned by um, a non-governmental organization that's gonna protect it in, in perpetuity. So that's 22 total locations that they need to be established of at least 50 breeding pairs. In addition, um, since we've started captive breeding and doing translocations and other um, protections of these birds, we want to phase that out. We don't, again, say we want them to be self-sustaining. And then an adequate amount of habitat is protected and managed. They don't put a number on adequate, but um, that will that's something that they will take into consideration when they start talking about um, potentially delisting. Where are we at now? Um, currently, we have five locations um, where they're breeding. Um, and there's a total over those five locations, there's about a um, hundred breeding pairs, maybe a little over that actually now, because that's an older number. I think that was from last year. So five are five locations. Um, we have the Three Lakes Wildlife Management Area, which is owned by the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission, FWC. 
Um, we have DeLuca Preserve, which is a um, owned by the University of Florida Foundation with a conservation easement that's held by Ducks Unlimited. There's Kissimmee Prairie Preserve State Park, which is a state state park uh, owned by the Florida Department of Environmental Protection. We have Corrigan Ranch, which is very unique in that um, half of it is owned by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and half of it is owned by um, the state uh, Department of Environmental Protection and it's um, uh, managed by Kissimmee Prairie, the, um, the team at Kissimmee Prairie. And then we have the Avon Park Air Force Range, which of course is a um, uh, U.S. Air Force Department of Defense military property. And you can see in this picture, um, so we have the outlines of all of our areas. We're kind of zoomed in on Osceola, Hot Polk, Highlands, and Okeechobee County, like the four points kind of come together um, there in the middle. And then you'll kind of see the hatch marks where um, we have our historic dry prairie. Um, historically, we don't 100% know with certain um, if they were in all of the historic dry prairie or only parts of it, but we do have records from Collier, Miami-Dade, DeSoto, Glades, Hendry, um, Highlands Polk, Okeechobee, and Osceola counties. Um, and of course, it's now con uh, contracted to this small area um, in what we call, what we usually describe as the Kissimmee River Basin um, population. Um, one thing of note that I, I put on this slide is um, Delaney in 1995 said that areas between about 240 to about 1300 hectares, which I kind of converted to square miles, um, there is needed to maintain a population of 50 breeding pairs. And if we remember, 50 breeding pairs is what we need in a population to get it off the list. So um, you can kind of see there's a little bit, I don't know, I do not know if my pointer is going to show up, but um, you'll kind of see there's the miles um, down in the corner there. And you can kind of get an idea of sort of some of these um, historic areas and, you know, that the, the populations that we have now, these pieces that we have now can definitely be able to help us hit those recovery goals, these five um, populations. Um, but we are recovering from this very precipitous decline. Okay. Which I have a little uh, graphic of here. Um, they've been surveying um, many of these sites since the 90s. Um, the blue line is Three Lakes Wildlife Management Area. The orange line is uh, Avon Park Air Force Range. The gray line is Kissimmee Prairie. And the yellow line is Deluca Preserve. Um, Deluca Preserve didn't um, start um, having monitoring done until 2015 um, when the private landowner at the time allowed the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and Archibald Biological Station and FWC to come out um, and start doing surveys at that property. Um, for a while, uh, it was, and it still is, until recently, this is an old map, 2022, a the Avon Park numbers have shot up beyond DeLuca now due to um, reintroductions, but for a while, the DeLuca Preserve was the second largest population of Florida grasshopper sparrows. And as you can see, precipitous decline until 2015. Um, in 2015 is when they started the captive breeding. Um, and then you'll see three lakes where they started introducing birds. We have that upward swing. I wish I had a newer, um, I wish I had a newer map, uh, uh, newer, because that's changed just a little bit. Uh-oh. Oh. Okay, there we go. Um, captive breeding, as I mentioned, the captive breeding program started in 2015. It's a collaboration with many, 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 many partners. Um, we have White Oak Conservation Foundation, Brevard Zoo, 
um, and even avian preservation and education conservancy actually doing the breeding. Um, so they take the birds from egg to uh, fledgling. Um, the FWC, the Florida DEP and Archibald Biological Station um, work to transport those birds um, to Three Lakes and to um, Avon Park Air Force Range. And we have um, Audubon, Florida is a big Dr. Paul Gray. Um, he sits on the working group for the Florida Grasshopper Sparrow. He provides great input on the work that we're doing. Um, we also have a partnership with Santa Fe Teaching College Zoo. Um, they sort of um, work as a holding um, area and they also have birds that we've um, found that were not able to be re reintroduced. They're um, an opportunity to teach folks um, about Florida grasshopper sparrows and captive breeding and also um, hold have a genetic holding, of course, um, for, for our birds. The f our funnest partner that we have involved is the Wallaca National Fish Hatchery, our fisheries program. Um, if you're familiar with uh, Eastern Indigo snakes, Wallaca also um, helps propagate Eastern Indigo snakes. And they also do head starting for uh, gopher tortoises. Uh, Wallaca has been an awesome and very unique partnership within the Fish and Wildlife Service because they are a fish hatchery, but they're producing more than just fish, which is great. We um, have had a lot of great successes over the last few years. Um, the birds, as I mentioned, are being released um, at Three Lakes Wildlife Management Area since 20, 2019. Um, and then we started introducing birds at Avon Park in 2021. Um, the recruitment of these introduced birds has actually exceeded our expectations. Um, the literature uh, sort of showed that there was a 10%, um, usually 10% recruitment is good um, when you're reintroducing sparrows out um, into the landscape. We are getting to about 20 to 25 percent and I believe one year we had 30 percent so very very good um they are going to be evaluating the last five years of the captive um the captive breeding program over the next um year or so year to really like nail down what exactly that recruitment looked like over that time period but on a year-to-year -year basis it's it has exceeded our expectations and we celebrated the 500th bird release in 2022, and we're just getting ready um, to celebrate our 1,000th bird released, um, likely by the end of this summer. So I'm going to play a really great video from Wild Path that um, shows some shows a little bit of what they're doing with the captive breeding um, program here um, for the grasshopper sparrows. There's nothing that makes me happier than going out to the sparrow site here at White Oak in the morning and hearing all those males buzzing. I remember when we started, very little was known about the species in the wild. You know, where do the birds go at night? Do they roost in a tree or do they roost in the ground? We didn't know. Good. <laughs> 17.8. So now we know where all the food has been going. <laughs> Deciding to start a conservation breeding program was a challenge because it required bringing birds that were in the wild when there were so few birds out there to begin with. Didn't even know if this is going to work out. We have 12 birds with us and we're hacking them to their native habitat in the Florida dry prairie. When they get here, we don't release them immediately. We put them in a killed aviary. 
We give them food and water there so that they can recover from their trip. Then they spend the night. This is a very exciting day. We have released over 500 Florida grasshopper sparrows in the wild. These birds have been released and we have six more to release in a few minutes. We're very excited to see this population growing, but that won't assure that in the long term, Florida grasshopper sparrows are going to do well. We have to support the protection of working landscapes and the conservation of the Florida Wildlife Corridor. We want to ultimately step back and let the sparrows breed and be wild birds on their own. And when you run, I'll follow you. And when you dream, I'll dream it too. It's an awesome video. <laughs> um, so we started the captive breeding program. We're on the upswing, but you know, what are some of the conservation concerns outside of their low population numbers um, that the Fish and Wildlife Service can are um, concerned with? Um, when we um, write up recover or when we look at the threats to um to a species we use what we call a five factor approach and you'll see those five factors here overutilization protections disease habitat predation and natural or man-made factors um overutilization basically means um are they being taken out of the wild for commercial purposes um are they being, um, is our experiments that are being done with them having a negative effect on uh, their, their populations? Fish and Wildlife Service determined that no, no overutilization at this point. This is as of 2022, the last time that we looked over these um, five factors. Um, protections. Protections mean, are there adequate protections for the Florida grasshopper sparrow to keep their populations from declining? We determined, yes, there's ad adequate protections. Um, we have a great working relationship with um, the fish, uh, with FWC and other regulatory agencies um, to be able to uh, provide recommendations and, and deter I guess, uh, some of the negative things that 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 could come about without um, adequate protections. Um, we also have a lot of properties uh, within the Florida grasshopper sparrow, um, kind of the, the main area that they're at, all the populations that we're working on currently are protected. Disease. Disease is an interesting one um, because uh, it was actually suggested to be part of that precipitous decline. Um, but we don't, we, we don't have, we didn't have, um, enough evidence to say, yes, it was a disease. Um, and we found in our work that we do with grasshopper sparrows currently that we aren't having a disease issue. Now, the last three here, these are really the ones that we are really focused on, um, currently with grasshopper sparrow recovery. Um, the habitat um, we found that 67% of the available potential habitat is conserved, and that was done in 2007. Um, and with the Florida Wildlife Corridor and other efforts that have happened, um, that number has probably increased. Um, but we did find that a lot of the areas that are native, or I should say available potential dry prairie, natural dry prairie habitat, excuse me. Um, so there's not very much natural dry habitat, dry prairie habitat left. Do we need to restore uh, native dry prairie habitat? I'll get to that one in a little bit. Predation. 
Uh, one of the biggest factors early on in the Florida grasshopper sparrows um, listing was predation. And this is from not just um, non-native species, but native normal species that um, occur out here on the dry prairie. Skunks, uh, coyotes, um, what's the other one that's raccoons naturally occur out here, natural nest predators, but we found that we we're having dismal, dismal um, nest success because of predation. One of the biggest ones being red imported fire ants. The third um, factor is, nat is anything that's nat natural or man-made factors. And generally that includes things like development, climate change, um, flooding events, drought, acts of God, as some people may say. Um, and so, of course, we're very familiar here in Florida. We have sea level rise. We have a lot of pe people moving into the state. Um, we are having uh, very extreme flooding, but also very extreme drought events. Um, and so we know that those are, those are affecting our Florida grasshopper sparrows. One thing I do want to note is genetics. We had this sort of bottleneck. They actually found that even though we sort of bottleneck down to very few grasshopper sparrows, they did a proper population viability analysis. And there is a very low, especially since we started doing the captive breeding, a very low chance that they're actually going to fall um, below the extinction threshold. So one, our work has brought them up, but also they had they had significant amount of genetic diversity in the birds that were exist, even that small number of birds that were existing on the landscape that were we are sort of out of the clear in terms of having any genetic issues. So we had our conservation challenges. What are some of our solutions to these factors? Predation has been um, something that uh, many of our biologists have worked on. Um, predator deflection fences. So we go out, we find every single Florida grasshopper sparrow nest that we can in these different in each of these populations, and we will put. Uh, I wish I had a picture of it. Um, I couldn't find a picture. We will put a three, two to three foot tall fence around the nest. Um, they will they will put um, a little bit of foam around the bottom of it so that they can't get dug under. And they're tall enough to where the predators, it's too much work to jump over it. So they just decide to, to go around and, and, not, and, and not deal with it. Worked very well for our mammalian predators, um, rats, uh, skunks, um, raccoons, coyotes. We found that nest survival went up to 60.4% versus 27.7% for the unfenced nests. That was great. Um, we're now finding that we've taken care of the mammalian predators, but we're now seeing that snakes are becoming a big problem. So they are actually trying to improve the design to add in a to add in something that will deter snakes because the snakes can eat they'll just go up and over it um we figured out how to get them from going under they can go up and over so we're trying to figure out ways that we can um we can solve that that issue right now fire ants red imported fire ants um are synonymous with the um existing uh disturbed habitats um, that Florida grasshopper sparrows may be found in in the future. We've, the dry prairie, not as bad of a problem. Even some of the areas where it's kind of a improved pasture and, and sort of semi-native, they're there, but still not as bad. But in the pastures, because of the cattle um, component in their, the disturbance, red imported fire ants have been a very, very big issue. 
Uh, one way we've um, gotten around it is we work with UCF. Um, they have one of the uh, premier fire ant experts and he actually developed, um, he actually studied the boiling water method. A lot of us are familiar with it in our backyards um, to treat, boil it, to use boiling water to treat the, the mounds and we do that within a 33 foot radius of every nest that we find. It's really hard to get some of the equipment out there. Um, you'll see in this picture, um, biologist is using what looks like a um, power sprayer and that is exactly what it is. Um, this is a specialized, um, this is specialized equipment developed by our partners at UCF. Um, it takes heated water, um, we put this, instrument onto a trailer, we drive it out into the prairie and we go around and we treat all these areas. Without this trailer, you're lugging around a propane tank and a large turkey fryer pan and a bunch of water. Um, and it's just very labor intensive. So we figured out um, using this specialized equipment, um, we can treat a lot of fire ant uh, mounds. And, and, in a, and we also found that we, that treating these colonies will actually reduce the overall fire ant presence on like a pasture on a property. So um, we will continue to do this and it may be something we have to do on all of these protected areas um, for a while, but once we see our numbers increase, hopefully we'll be able to ratchet back that back um, to where we don't have to treat every every fire ant now. Um, let's see. So the next the next issue, our next factor, natural and man made. This picture is from Deluca Preserve last year. Um, unprecedented amount of rain. Um, that's the dry prairie. Um, under probably about a foot of water. Um, in this case, some of these, only certain number of these options will work. Um, one thing that we found is we will actually lift a nest. Um, if we see in the forecast that there's going to be several inches of rain, we will literally lift, lift the nest. We'll take a shovel right next to the nest and lift up the dirt underneath of it. So it's just a few inches above, and so it doesn't get inundated with water. That's been really successful. If, like in the case of this, this photo, we find that it's a very significant amount of rain that's coming to where nest lifting may not work, um, we will take the eggs, nestlings, or fledglings, depending on what's out on the, on the landscape, and we'll move them into the captive breeding program. Um, so we don't wanna lose those genetics, right? We don't wanna lose those birds, every bird counts. So if we can move them into the captive breeding program, um, we're gonna have more success. We've also um, we've also done uh, just temporarily removing the nestlings, keeping them um, you know, indoors overnight and then putting them back in the nest. We don't do that very frequently um, anymore, but it was a technique that had been used in the past. And we found that this um, has increased our nest success, which was one of our major, major factors um, in, in listing the species. So we've talked about habitat, or we've talked about predation. Um, we talked a bit about natural man-made factors, some of the solutions that we've come up with. What about habitat? And that's the world I live in. Do we really need to restore back to native dry clearing? And some of the work that we've done at DeLuca Preserve has um, had a sort of questioning that uh, that logic in um, regional recovery plan. So Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission, you know, describes the, well, describe what I described earlier, treeless grasslands, they, they forage um, on the ground. It's dependent on frequent burning um, within two years of uh, burning and, you know, maintained by wildfires ignited by lightning. And I should have underlined this or prescribed fires set by cattle ranchers. 
the Fish and Wildlife Service um, in our 2022 five-year review said, currently semi-improved pasture lands support approximately a third of the known breeding population of grasshopper sparrow, while large areas of seemingly high quality dry prairie habitat remain unoccupied. So what's the role of private lands in, in Florida grasshopper sparrow, um, in Florida grasshopper sparrow recovery? Here's a great zoomed out map of uh, the historical extent of dry prairie. Um, the black box is the DeLuca Preserve. DeLuca Preserve was formerly, um, well, formerly was slated to become a, a very large scale development. Um, the DeLuca family, um, there was some litigation around it. I won't get into the weeds on that, but the DeLuca family and Mr. Mr. DeLuca passed away and his family decide, didn't, we're trying to decide what they wanted to do with the property. Fish and Wildlife Service, um, uh, Archibald and FWC approached um, approached their land manager and said, hey, you're very close to these populations of grasshopper sparrows. You guys actively have cattle grazing, cattle ranching um, happening on the property. You have a lot of great habitat out here. Would you allow us to come out and survey for grasshopper sparrows? They did. And it kicked off an, um, a great relationship that has helped to uncover some of the secret life of grasshoppers that don't live in pristine dry prairie. Um, so as you can see here, a large, there's a large um, dry prairie extent. And this is pre-settlement. Um, a lot of these areas, of course, have are either already been developed or have development quickly encroaching on them. Um, but historically, there has been there in the past where there were um, grasshopper sparrows kind of found in patches sort of along this whole area. The majority today the, of these lands are cattle ranches um, or people who are agricultural are agricultural um, our agricultural sector. Um, so they are great. Gonna, they are the partners that we need to get to our recovery goals. Um, so DeLuca Preserve, we're in, we went from here to, we're looking at the ground now. This is probably, uh, one of these pictures was probably taken in the prairie that was behind me. Um, DeLuca Preserve has sort of three different types of habitat, um, that the sparrows like. We have our semi-native, or we have our, our native, um, dry prairie. Um, which has our wire grass and runner oak and palmettos and our andropogon species. Um, we have our semi-native pasture, which is a blend of our improved pasture and our um, and our native prairie. Um, maybe a little less of the bunch grasses like the andropogons, um, but they still have and maybe a little less palmetto, but still plenty of grasses. Um, and then our improved pasture, which in this picture, you can see there's still palmetto in there. Improved pasture is mainly your Bahia grasses and your Kogan grass, or I'm sorry, carpet grass. No Kogan grass. We don't want Kogan grass. <laughs> um, and so, but but very a, a very low, low, low density, a, the lower, lowest density of our native, our native grasses and our native vegetation. Grasshopper sparrows like all of this. They like everything you see in this picture. Three Lakes is, looks more like the right. The Lucum looks more like the left, with a little bit of the right sprinkled in. Um, oh, I was gonna switch out this map, but this is a map of DeLuca Preserve. Um, each of these points is where we do point counts um, in the spring to find out if there's nesting grasshopper sparrows. Um, You'll see on the right hand side or the middle of the map, um, that is what we would call semi improved pasture. You'll see two hatched areas. Those are our two major pieces of native dry prairie um, on DeLuca. Just to the north of those um, areas is um, some more semi improved pasture. 
And then the areas that are right along 60, and you can kind of see that they're very kind of blocked out. Um, those areas are um, the improved pasture areas. And we are gonna kind of zoom in here to sort of a cross section. And we find most of our sparrows kind of in this area um, of, of DeLuca Preserve. This is a map from last year. Um, this map shows all of the mail perches um, on DeLuca, the males that were perched at DeLuca Preserve. Um, you'll see that they found how many are there? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine different males. Um, one of them, you see all the X's in the name. That's a male that does not have a band. So all those letters are band um, combinations. So all the birds are banded. Every bird that we can catch, we band because we want to follow this, these populations. We want to see, are they moving in between? But we do find birds that are unbanded. Where might they be coming from? Um, and so we, we see sort of these aggregations where there are some birds that are in sort of these, in the, the more improved pastures so the, to the north. Then we have the birds in the semi-improved, which is kind of in the middle of the map. There's no birds in the in the native dry prairie. And I circled this. My my colleague actually circled this when she gave the presentation on um, the DeLuca um, birds. But the bird that was unbanded, he hung out mostly in the um, mostly in the improved or the improved pasture in the pasture areas. And so that makes us wonder, did he come from a population or did he come from a group that came from uh, one of our working ranches that has improved pasture, maybe across the street, maybe down south? Um, we don't know. He's not banded, so we don't know. Um, and that's a question that we also kind of have is where, you know, we we have a lot of birds that we've we banded and we see them moving around um, between populations, but then we also get this recruitment of unbanded birds. Um, DeLuca um, for a little while was kind of a hot spot for um, unbanded birds. Last year was a Last year was a sad year because of the, the flooding, but as you can see in previous years, we'll have you know anywhere from as high as 15 to five, um, just under five, four to five birds that um, come in that we're not sure, at least males that we're not sure. Um, we're not sure where they they where they nested, where what where their where their parents were. So because of our work at DeLuca and seeing, hey, there's been, there's successful breeding grasshopper sparrows in an area that's a working cattle ranch. DeLuca Preserve continues to have a cattle lessee out there. Um, they also have a very active um, hunting uh, program, um, recreation. Um, it's owned by University of Florida. Um, they open it up and do events out there. They have researchers out there. Um, so there's a lot going on at DeLuca, but it it has kept sort of its historic um, land use. And so we've used it as a way to sort of learn more about these sparrows that are living in um, on ranch lands. Um, and so that has helped uh, myself um, and Archibald. We're working on a project to put together some um, habitat restoration uh, and not really restoration, that's probably not the right word, but some recommendations on uh, if you're a cattle ranch and you're near some of these, uh, you know, you're a rancher and you're near some of these areas where there's there could be grasshopper sparrows, sparrows and ranching go together. Here's some suggestions of things you can do. Um, and my program can provide financial assistance to help that um, with doing that. Um, and some of our partners on this could, um, we're looking at adding in uh, NRCS, which um, they work, they, they're the big agency that works with um, our ranchers and our farmers to do um, conservation. 
And then um, a lateral conservation trust actually has um, a rangeland specialist down here um, doing work on grazing. So um, folding in these experts um, to sort of see, hey, well, here's what we're doing for sparrows. Here's what we're doing for um, for grasshopper or for for cattle. How can these things play together? And then disseminate that out to um, our ranchers and, and the folks on the landscape. Um, and I I mentioned that here, you know, providing that funding um, and sort of that incentive. Um, Corrigan Ranch I mentioned, and that was one of the populations. That was a recent win. Um, Corrigan Ranch was formerly a cattle ranch, um, and it was acquired by the Fish and Wildlife Service and the DEP. Um, it actually, I wish that I had Corrigan's numbers when they first um, found, when they first did the surveys, but um, it was up there with DeLuca, and actually I think it surpassed DeLuca in terms of the largest number of birds on a property that was not protected at the time. Um, so great successful collaboration um, with a willing landowner. He was um, ready to kind of get out of the business and the Fish and Wildlife Service. And um, we had help with the, from the Air Force, DEP, um, the state agencies um, to, to, to get that acquired. And now um, another population of Florida grasshopper sparrows. Um, so that's kind of like my realm that I live in is this encouraging folks to do um, good conservation and um, getting out the word that sparrows and ranching go together and uh, we want to keep uh, working lands working. So I'm going to end it there since I only have about five minutes left um, and open it up for any questions that folks may have. Um, I have a few. I, I want to say thanks to all of our partners. You'll see all of their logos here on the screen. And if you'd like to get in contact with me, I also put my contact information here on, on the slide as well. Well, thank you so much. That was such an in-depth program. Yeah, that was really good. <clears throat> so if you have questions, you can put them in the chat, or if you don't want to type, you can unmute yourself <laughs> and just Ask your questions. We're gonna sneak into their question. Anybody have any questions? <laughs> Well, I have a question because we have the um, the eastern grasshopper sparrows that come down in in um, in the winter time. Are there any interactions between the two species? So there has been um, there has been some genetic there has been genetic work done, um, and uh, and I don't want to say the wrong thing. Um, but there has in the past, um, they have shown that they do, there is some interaction between the two species. Um, but I am not, I'm not a genetics expert. So um, I do, but I do know that like historically there has been interactions between the two, which is good for sort of that genetic, uh, keeping that genetic diversity up. So Karen Maharas. Arts, sorry, my vision. She wanted to know how many acres does each sparrow need to be successful? Um, man, I wish that I had writ written this down um, for the territory size for the Florida grasshopper sparrow. So, um, I mean, we saw in the previous slides for 50 breeding pairs, we need about one square mile on the smallest. So I guess if we divide that out, <laughs> um, they don't need a very large, for each sparrow, their territory size isn't isn't very large. Um, and I should have that number and I don't have it in front of me. Oh. 
want to do the math on that. See if I can map it out real quick. <laughs> Actually, see if I can pull up that number from the, the review. You can ask me any question about fire and I'd know it, but as soon as we get it, an individual species needs that, I got to, I lean on the experts for that one. Um, okay. So was your job, you were talking about fire, is that mainly one of your big components when you're working with conservation in other private lands? Yeah, so a lot of the times when we, fire is the cheapest um, and easiest, well, used to be the easiest. Sometimes it's getting a little harder with climate change, but um it's the cheapest and easiest way to get a habitat to the, um, you know, our desired end goal or our end, end goal, right? Um, well, some of the other mechanisms that we use, we'll do mowing. Um, if, you know, everything's, high, usually it's the height, right? So mowing is another one that we'll use. Um, we'll do, um, what we would, what I would call brush management, but really it's going out there, you know, with the big equipment and, chew, you know, chewing up the, um, chewing up kind of that mid story to try to get, you know, back down, mulching machines, things like that. Um, that would be like the, the probably most intensive. I, I should also put cattle in there with mowing because, um, sometimes if a, a, a section has been excluded if cattle have been excluded from it and introduce cattle you can have some of the same effects as like mowing would have not quite the same as fire but pretty but close to what mowing would would provide in terms of like lowering the the overstory i guess or the mid story as we would call it When you do boiling water on the, the fire ants, does that just drive them to a different place or does it kill them? It kills them. <laughs> okay. That's good to know. Yeah. Um, it's, it's not, it's, so it's boil, so they boil it and then they let it sit to cool off maybe a couple of degrees. Um, so it's, they say it's almost boiling water. Um, but yeah, so they'll, they'll back it off and then they'll pour it they don't spray it with like the power washer. The power washer has a specific thing, but like if you're at home doing it, it's just literally pouring it in there kind of at a moderate pace and they will, they can't handle it. <laughs> oh. So I think Kathy's going to um, boil some water tomorrow. No, I'm just kidding. I don't have any in my yard, thankfully. But I just think about that. Yeah, and and I forgot to mention the reason why we chose boiling water over, say, um, you know, something like um, a pesticide like Amdro is what a lot of folks use at home. Um, is there are no um, there are no uh, and especially working out on cow on a cattle ranch, there are no pesticides where there wouldn't be an interaction with with the cattle. Um, so if for whatever reason a cattle walked into the area and munched on, you know, some of the stuff around the fire ants and there was some of the, the stuff on there, um, it's just too big of a risk. Um, the other um, concern in the natural areas is a grasshopper sparrow and a lot of and, and a lot of our birds of course are they eat insects and so you're putting a pesticide out on the landscape and we do not want to affect have any non-target effects right we just want to affect the fire ants we don't want to affect our native ants or any other um, insect species that's good mm -hmm. Okay, I don't see any other questions. Nope. So 
we wish everyone a happy rest of your summer. Stay cool. Yeah. Go birding early in the morning. And yeah, we'll we'll um, be back September, the first Thursday of September for more bird chats, but go to our YouTube channel. Mm -hmm. And if you think of more questions for our guest, you can email her and um, yeah. And go Thank put you for water on your fire ants if you have it. <laughs> you can go put one. <laughs> That's good. All right. So I'm going to stop the recording. All right. Thank you so much.